So I'm just going to get this recording. So whoever, um, if you're here and you need to duck out early, don't worry about it. We will be sending a follow-up email uh, with the recording so you can keep an eye on it. Um, and Christian has also offered to send out uh, the slides as a PDF so you can kind of keep uh, take a look at it later on. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, I say we're going to get started. Um, people may keep continue to pop in. Um, but I think we should get going. So with further ado, um, I just wanted to introduce everyone that is here. So um, my name is Cassandra. I am the Shopify local community manager in Vancouver, as well as up the Sea to Sky corridor, all the way up to Whistler. Um, Typically we run in-person events. However, we've kind of shifted and we're doing more virtual, um, which is really exciting because then coworkers like myself, Nikki and Craig get to work together on larger events. So I'll let Nikki and Craig introduce themselves and then we'll get going. Hey friends, uh, I'm Nikki. I work with Kaz and Craig on our Shopify local team. Um, I am the community manager here in Victoria, British Columbia, and it's really great to see all of you. I will echo that. Thank you so much for coming out. I am Cray and I am the community manager in Kelowna and the Okanagan. So if you're in the area, feel free to hit me up and let's chat. Otherwise, uh, enjoy the session. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so today we have a presentation that uh, Christian is facilitating from Marwick Marketing. Uh, he's located in Squamish, which is really nice for me. Um, hopefully we get to go for a beer one day. Um, when we can actually hang out together. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Christian. Um, again, we will be going through a question and answer period at the end. Um, so feel free to pop them into the chat. Otherwise, keep them for the end and then we can go through them all together. Great. Thank you, Cassandra. <clears throat> and thank you for uh, having us at Marwick Martin. And it's, uh, it's been fun putting this uh, presentation together. Um, so the purpose of this workshop is to uh, look at different ways that we can use the Google platform to sell more, whether you are in the process of opening your own store online, if you already have a store, or if you're pretty, you know, quite far down the line and, and you're just looking at new ways to increase your sales. Um, this is that kind of workshop for you. It's going to be about half an hour, 30 minutes to 40 minutes. And as Cassandra mentioned, we'll do a kind of a, a Q&A at the end as well. So um, e-commerce sales uh, in 2020 are expected to reach $4.2 trillion by the end of this year. So the, the shift in online purchasing and online sales is, is massive and it's snowballing. So it accounts for about 26% of the population 26% of the global population are regular online shoppers. So uh, the, the shift has definitely happened and it will, it's continuing to happen. And so we're looking at ways that we can be there when our customers are looking to buy or research our products online. And for today's presentation, we're focused on the Google ad platform. So let's take a look at those areas so google ads uh, actually um, encompasses quite a broad area of of many different channels and we're going to cover five of those today um, five of the most kind of recognized and, and most popular uh, most used kind of channels the first one is google search the second one is using the google display network to target people that are in the market for something that you sell we're gonna look at Google remarketing or retargeting, and we're gonna look at YouTube advertising, and finally, Google shopping. So a lot of Googling going on there, but uh, you'll, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a clear idea of uh, which one might be the best option for you, uh, add some kind of clarity behind the differences between all of them. And, uh, and again, as I mentioned, there'll be time at the end for some Q and A uh, towards the end of that. So as I mentioned, uh, $4.2 trillion we're spending every year. There's 2 billion active online shoppers in the world, which is 26% of the entire global population. So if there was any ever a good time to start selling online, it's right now. And we're gonna look at Google search. Uh, this is the most uh, commonly recognized platform within the Google ad program. Uh, no doubt everyone's seen it. Um, when you go to Google and you type in a keyword or a search phrase or you ask Google a question, the first four placements are ads uh, that show up 
above the organic listings there. So the nice thing about the Google search ads is that um, it's, more, it's very instantaneous. It's very instant as long as your bid and the campaign has been built well and, and depending on your competition, it's very simple to get to the top of, pay, top of Google or, or even first on Google. Again, that depends on how, you're, how much you're prepared to bid on a certain keyword. And I'll come back to that one in a minute. And it depends on how well the campaign's been optimized and obviously the competition in that market. Uh, you can see on the, on, on the right hand side of the screen there, I've given you an example of a winemaking kit. Um, and you have the first ad there is the winery in Coombs, which is on the island, and how they've matched their ad up based on that search term. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, fantastic for targeting people in a certain location. So you can be as specific as a, a postcode area, uh, a couple of cities, it could be a pro provincial, national or international. So it's very targeted in terms of where that person's searching, if they're on their cell phone or desktop. Um, it's instant once the campaign is live and you've added um, your, all your details and you, and you, and you go live, the, the ads are pretty instant to appear on Google there, which is great compared to uh, maybe like organic SEO that takes time for a website to appear higher up on the Google search results. And you can pay for what you want. You set the budget, you're in control of the budget there. We're going to talk about budget in the next slide. Um, some downsides to the search ads, uh, it can be mismanaged. Um, there is, uh, if you're looking to do this yourself, I highly recommend educating yourself on the different types of different categories of a keyword, uh, broad match, exact match, and phrase match keywords. So one keyword like winemaking kit can have three different variations and that will trigger your ad depending on uh, the variations you pick. So just uh, again, that's something to be aware of. I won't dive into that. That's a whole nother subject. Um, but definitely take the time to educate yourself on the different types of keywords that when you are bidding on them, that you're bidding on ones that are very specific to what you're selling. Uh, otherwise it can get expensive and you could end up paying for a lot of clicks that you don't necessarily need or want. And the final one there on the cons list is that it can be competitive, depending on what you're selling. Uh, obviously, if you're selling diamond necklaces for Yorkshire Terriers, that's probably pretty lucrative and you might be the only one doing it, so it's going to be cheap. If you're selling uh, cameras, then that's probably going to be pretty competitive as well. So, Again, the Google search one is the most recognized one. It's something we, we use uh, probably knowingly or unknowingly every single day. Uh, it's the one that's very visual. You can see it when you type in your own company name or what you sell, your ad is there. So it's very visual. And that's um, the first one that we're gonna start with there. So before I go into the other kind of, the other ways you can advertise on Google, one question we always get at Marwick Marketing uh, here in Canada is what should my budget be? And obviously it's, it's an advertising platform and unlike uh, traditional advertising or some other platforms where you set a budget and then you kind of forget about it, you're in complete control of this. I don't know who scribbled on my <laughs> presentation there, it's probably me. Um, the nice thing about Google is that you can set the budget. So there's a few questions you have to ask yourself here is, is, is how far do you want to reach? Okay, you, can, you can target a, a, small a small town with a small budget and you can target the whole world for a much bigger budget. So your budget will definitely have to scale depending on the geographic um, areas you want to target. You also want to look at how much it's going to cost when somebody clicks on that ad. So the whole Google ad platform is a cost per click advertising platform. So you don't pay for anything until somebody clicks on your ad. At that point you get billed, whatever the cost per click is. So uh, again, taking the example of this uh, diamond studded necklaces for Yorkshire Terriers, probably known as bidding against you. So your cost per click could be as little as 10 cents. Um, if you're selling cameras, well, the, the example here is a camera, so Nixon D750, the co average cost per click is just under a dollar. So it gives you an idea that cost per click is going to scale. So something to figure out. The third one what you're, around what your budget should be is how many clicks or how many visitors to your website does it take to sell something? 
So that's uh, referred to as conversion rate. If you're selling something that doesn't require a lot of shopping around, uh, for example, bedding, something quite boring, like fitted sheets, uh, if you find one that's kind of in your budget and you like, there's probably a higher probability you're going to buy it. If you're selling something that uh, takes a little bit more research, that's more of a uh, thought out process, then you're going to need more people coming to your website to because uh, the conversion or the likelihood of them making an instant purchase can be much lower. So being aware of what your conversion rate would be. So if you had 100 people visit the website, out of those 100 people, how many people are going to take that instant purchase and, and buy something? The fourth one there is what can you afford? Let's be realistic here. Uh, the world is, is upside down and back to front at the moment. There's no point setting a budget that you can't afford and sustain. It's better to set a smaller budget and run it on an ongoing basis so that you can improve the campaign rather than going all out for 10 days. Um, another way of, of looking at it is reverse engineering that and saying, okay, what is my glass ceiling? Like how many people in the world are looking for diamond necklaces for Yorkshire Terriers? Uh, or in this case, a better example is how many people are looking for a Nixon or a Nixon D750 digital camera? And the answer is, in Canada anyway, is uh, done on impression. So how many times someone searched, or not someone, how many people have searched come off? And in Canada, uh, it's 5,000, on average, 5,200 people look every single month for this specific camera. The average cost per click is, less, is about a dollar, which means if you were to pay for every single click or every single time someone searched for this camera, your glass ceiling would be just under $5,000 a month. That's, get it, that's uh, highly unlikely. You're not going to have 100% click through. If 5,000 people are looking for your product, it's very unlikely that 100% of those people are going to come see your ad and go straight to your website. So what we refer to is a click through rate. So if 100 people are searching for your product, uh, on this product in particular, the kick, click through rate is just under 4%. So every 100 people that are looking for this camera, about four of those people will actually see the ad and click through, which is the click through rate. From there, we know that if we can, we know what the cost would be, and we know how many visitors will come to the website. So these 197, uh, these 197 visitors that come from the website are now on your website, looking at the product that they were searching for. So they're already highly qualified shoppers. They're now on the website. And assuming your website then takes those 100 people and puts them through the whole process of researching the product through the shopping cart to actually buying something, it's probably around 2%. So it's looking at about four sales for at the value of two and a half thousand dollars. So you can use these numbers. It's very easy to log into Google ads. You don't need to sign up for anything. You don't need to pay anything. I'm going to give you details at the end of this presentation, on how to do that within Google ads. You have a uh, keyword forecast section that you can use to do this exact kind of thing. So you'll be able to look at what keywords, are linked to your products, see how many people are looking every month, figure out what the click-through rate is and what the cost is. You can actually reverse engineer, like what is the most I could physically spend to get every single person that's interested in buying my product, and then look at like you know, what's more affordable and where do I want to target locally. So you can see there's no uh, straight easy answer on how much should I spend on Google. You just got to make sure that you're getting that return on whatever you're spending. And once you understand that you're getting a return, it doesn't really matter how much you spend because you know for every dollar you put in at the beginning, you're gonna get 10, 20, five times X back on that. So kind of covering budgets, it's a bigger, quite a big chunk of it, but I just wanted to um, touch base on that while we were talking about the search ads. In terms of how it works, Google um, allows you to set a daily budget. So if it's $10 a day or $50 a day or $5,000 a day, once you use up that budget from people clicking on the ad, your ads come offline until the next day. So you never go over budget. Uh, Google also has an algorithm that will recognize if maybe one of your competitors is sat clicking on your ad 
and it will actually uh, block them and refund the account. So the, the days of other people being able to just click on your ad and use up your budget have long gone. And that's, uh, that's Google search. So it's a big one, but it's the most recognized and most commonly used at a Google platform for, in terms of Google ads. So moving along, uh, not as in depth the next few, but I just wanted to give you an overview of the other ones that work really well for selling more online with Google. And that's the display campaign. So Google display, you can see here, uh, I was checking the surf forecast for Vancouver Island, um, Magic Seaweed, which is a website that hosts Google ads. On the right hand side, um, I was in the market for mosquito spray. So they understand that Google through multiple touch points can build up audiences based on a number of things. One of them is the subject of being in market for something. So with or without knowing it, we're, we give signals to Google uh, via uh, the way that we use the internet that signals to Google that we might be in the market to purchase something. So in this case, it's uh, mosquito spray. Uh, the reason that ad was delivered to me is my screenshot is I'm aware that for the last kind of like 10 days, I've been looking at booking campsites. I've been looking at um, just accessories for camping and all that kind of stuff. So that could be because I'm researching products online. It could be that I'm looking at videos. It could be that I'm on a visiting camping website. So all these kind of little micro moments, these signals uh, give Google, and it's not somebody sat at Google, you know, with my picture on the wall building my profile up, it's the algorithm and the AI is building up an audience in the knowledge that I'm potentially in market to buy mosquito spray. So it's pretty smart how it does it. So by targeting people in market, and that could be in market for a camera, could be in market for a haircut, could be in market to find a, a family lawyer, we can target people based on, or you, and you can by logging into Google Ads, uh, you're able to connect with the customers while they're going through that process of potentially taking action to buy something or hire you uh, if you're a service provider. It's really good for brand awareness. Uh, you, your ads are placed not specifically on a website, they're placed specifically because of, of the user. So sometimes the ads will show on big publications like New York Times or um, Time Out or you know, th these kind of channels that you may be caught uh, unaffordable for you to approach that publication directly and advertise across. So it's great brand alignment, brand awareness that for your product. Uh, it's very cost effective. Again, you set the budget for every thousand views. Uh, so it's, it's, you, you set the budget. If you want to spend $30 to get a thousand people seeing your ad, um, you're pretty much guaranteed to get that. The only downsides to this is that it is usually mismanaged. Uh, any, even at quite a high level of management, the ads can, the, these campaigns can be a bit mismanaged. And, and I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. If I'm in the market for cat going camping and, and I'm being delivered these products, that's great. Um, I'm now driving to the, the camping shop and the kids are screaming in the back, so I give them my phone to shut them up. And the YouTube video comes on, uh, uh, Peppa Pig or something, and then there's an ad delivered to me for mosquitoes. And of course, kids with, with their sticky fingers, instead of pressing clear, click the ad, and then the advertiser is incurring the cost. So by mismanaged, we've, we've really dialed in uh, a negative placement list. So you kind of want to make sure that while the ads are targeting me as a user, that we also want to exclude places where the ads are um, too easily pressed by people that were, that it was not intended to. You'll see a lot of ads in free mobile or cell phone games. Um, that's a real money drain as well. Some of the other kind of mistakes that people make is that the ads lack creativity and then get lost in the, the web that site as well. Um, there are other ways to target based on display. One is the, the actual topic of the website. Another is, is keyword placement and then um, intent, which is not spelled right, but it's kind of funny that it's camping related. Uh, the intent of someone as well. So there's, there's lots of different ways to target through display advertising. 
for selling products online in market is the best. Um, and again, you'll, I'll show you how you'll be able to log into Google Ads and set up a Google display campaign based on the audience being in market for something. And that something is, there's a big list that you can choose from. So that's Google display, at least one of the Google displays anyway. Google display remarketing. This is a really powerful one and, and is probably the second most commonly used one. Um, you can see here that I was on Daily Hive, which is a, a local uh, news or a national news website now. Um, they offer up advertising space to Google. Uh, with Marwick is advertising to me because about 10 minutes before I was making this presentation, I was on, my own, on, a, on our own website. So it recognizes that uh, I had previously visited the website and now it's delivering ads to me to remind me to, to go back. So this is really good uh, for selling products online because 70% of people will, will go all the way through the website, they'll look at all the products, do all the research, they'll get to the cart and for whatever reason they never press buy. So 70% of the people you've spent all that time and money and energy get into the website 77 out of 10 of those people are just going to leave with taking no action. Now, what this does is we're able then to advertise to those people for a set period of time after that, uh, after their interaction with our website. So this is really good for brand lift, um, great for brand awareness and super cost effective. And if it's something that's of a higher value, like a camera or a piece of real estate or something that, you know, we understand that customers are going to go off and research elsewhere. This just keeps your product and your store top of mind while they're going through that buying process of looking at where they should buy it. Um, remarketing works well in the fact that it's cost effective because you're not paying until somebody actually clicks on the ad and returns back to the website. And if you get really smart at it, smart at it what you can do is you can actually uh, make the ad show the product that was left in the car as a reminder that this is the specific product that's still waiting for you in the car. And if you can hook in a special offer, um, that always drives up the um, success of those campaigns. So a really good one to do. Uh, works on the same Google display um, channel as the previous one, but this one you're targeting based on the fact that they had previously been on your website. So again, mismarriage for the same reasons as the one prior. And sometimes we can, they get set up too broad. So if you're, if you're, if you're a shop with many, many products, um, let's say you sell um, uh, candy and somebody was there and they're very specifically wanting two kilos of uh, chocolate and then you deliver them an ad that's Skittles. That's not, connect, it's not connecting the dots. So if you have lots of products, it's great to set up more dynamic remarketing so that you're advertising back the product that they were actually interested in. When it's too broad, there's the people don't put the two and two together. So that's Google Display Remarketing. Uh, again, like I said, it's this, probably the second most common one after the search. The third one here, uh, YouTube Advertising. Uh, this isn't used as much as it could be, uh, mostly because it, sometimes it can be um, hard to find where or how to build out the actual video. But when you do figure that out, the uh, video advertising can work in all the same ways that display can. So we can target people based on their intent, based on them being in market to buy something. We can target people based on uh, whether they've visited the website before. And it, and, and it works really well because it increases the brand lift and awareness. Um, you have the option to have longer skippable ads, which I'm sure everyone's in and very short 15 second non-skippable ads. Uh, a good example of this is the camera that we were talking about at the beginning. If it's, it's obviously a more considered purchase, so people are gonna be looking to do a lot of research. YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world, so that's the most obvious place. They're gonna be watching reviews about this camera, how to use it, maybe unboxing videos that seem to be all the rage now. Uh, but having your ad placed before that is going to be super powerful in terms of uh, brand alignment. Again, it gets mismanaged for exactly the same reasons as all the others, uh, just the wrong time, wrong place. Uh, the, uh, you actually, the, the other con is where you've got to produce the video. Um, it doesn't have to be Hollywood, but it does, there is an additional cost. 
whether you hire someone to do something in person or if you're hiring someone to make and explain a video, there's that initial cost of building out the video there. And banner blindness. Uh, when we do too much, when we advertise too much to someone that they start ignoring it, that, that's called banner blindness and that can happen sometimes too. Super powerful though. Uh, and a great way to be aligned with a lot of the reviews or the research uh, section of the buying process. So we have the final one here is Google Shopping. Um, this is works in the same way as pay per click. The only difference is instead of the search ads, it's actually pulling imagery and it's pulling the uh, stock from your website. So if you have uh, inventory listed on your website, it pulls that inventory feed into Google and the nice thing about this is it does cost a little bit more than the search ads, but it's a lot more visual. So if somebody sees something that they don't want, uh, in this case, I probably don't want the one on the, in the middle, um, I'm not gonna click on it. So I'm not wasting clicks, so I'm not wasting budgets because I can already see what it is. Uh, so that's great. Another good thing is it links to your online reviews. If you're using Trustpilot or uh, some of the other platforms there to build up your customer reviews to install trust on your website. You can actually link those to your ads as well. Uh, the downside to these is it, it can be a little tricky to set up, uh, you know, configuring the inventory feed and making sure it's all synced and it can be competitive. But once it's up and running, it's a, it's a very powerful tool and a very visual and a, a great way to get your product out there. And you can see with the shopping ads that we the shop name or the brand name is listed underneath the actual product as well. So they're the main channels. Uh, we found a lot of uh, our clients that have stores have found a lot of success with. Uh, they vary in degree of difficulty uh, setting up. Uh, search ads are very easy. Shopping ads, YouTube ads are a little bit trickier. Uh, my suggestion would be to start, start in one, uh, start in one area and, and, and focus on that. So how to get it set up. You have a couple of ways of doing it. The obvious ways is to visit ads.google.com. Uh, my suggestion here is to um, maybe do some of the online Google ad courses first. Google has a lot of resources that if you can take the time out just to do a couple of the courses, you're gonna save a lot of money and a lot, a lot of time rather than just going in and trying to build out the campaigns and ad groups and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can also connect with a Google rep representative online and they will, uh, depending on the volume of um, customer service, they can, they can guide you through that process. Uh, it's something to be aware about going through that process though is that you're not, it's not going to be as detailed and as optimized as maybe a competitor. So, but certainly it doesn't cost anything to sign into Google Ads. You can use all those free tools that I had at the beginning of the presentation. And you can play around with it, start small, and just see, you know, you'll be able to analyze the data as it comes in. Uh, or you can don't, don't DIY, don't DIY, does that make sense? Uh, uh, you can hire someone locally, or you can hire a Google partner agency like Marwick, and they will build the account for you, and then you can manage it, or they will build it and manage it for you. Uh, so there's a few ways to get started there. My last slide, uh, it's kind of a little bonus slide. I got some free tools here. Um, while you're playing and, and working out how to sell more of Google Ads, it's really important to make sure that your website functions well. There's no point spending money and time pushing people to your website if your website sucks. So there's a few ways to make sure that your website doesn't suck. You can use, uh, we have a free tool on our website that will actually test how optimized the website is. Uh, for search engines. The second one here on the Google developers platform is a really fun, easy tool to use to decide to see how fast your website loads on a cell phone, on a desktop. Uh, anything that loads over a few seconds, you can pretty much kiss goodbye to anyone visiting your website because people get frustrated and are, and are extremely impatient these days. So making sure that you're able to see how fast your website loads and then work to improve the uh, speed time will increase the number of sales that come through on your website. Then the third and final one is making full use of uh, Google Trends. Or, and that's the website trends.google.com. This is a great place to look for how products uh, or potentially new products are trending either by country or globally over a period of time. 
So if you're looking to, uh, maybe you're looking to add a new category to your website of new products, using Google Trends will tell you if that category is increasing in demand or dropping in demand. So it's a great resource to have bookmarked and use a lot there. So we covered a lot. Um, we've covered the, the five or six different kind of Google ad channels there. And each one would deservedly normally take an entire day to go through in depth, but hopefully that's giving you a good insight into what's out there and what, what can be done. You, know, you're, you can easily log into Google Ads and start working through your own campaigns and building them out. So I encourage you to do so. Uh, but that's it from me. I'm going to pass back to Cassandra. And Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, so for everyone that's here, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. If you do want to come up and turn your video on and ask them, go by all means. Um, in the meantime, I have two questions. So for people who are just starting, um, budget can be um, quite a, a big question, right? So when we're first getting started, do you have any suggestions in terms of like, um, budgets that you could start out with, uh, just in terms like, is it, you know, do I have to spend a hundred dollars to, to get this up and running or could it be as little as a hundred or like $5? What are kind of your suggested bu budgets for yeah, so, just starting out? So Google works on daily budgets. Uh, so you got to, it, again, it's, it's good. It's better to think about it the other way around. So you have, let's say a, a cost per click or a cost. What is it? A cost, well, the cost of someone that's looking for what you do to come to your website is a dollar. So that's the cost per click. If your budget's $10 a day, then you're gonna get the maximum of 10 people a day come to your website. If it's 50 cents, you're gonna get 20 people come to your website. So it's kind of like, well, how many people do you need to come to the website in order to sell what you're selling? Uh, the budget has to be, it has to be comfortable. Um, and you wanna get it to a place that if you're spending $10 a day, you're making $40, $50 a day, at, at least. And then you can increase that. But as a starting point, I, it depends, again, it depends on the business, how far you wanna reach and what you're selling. So there's no definitive answer, but that's the best way to think about it is like, how many people do I want to come to the website? And what is the cost per click? Amazing, thank you. I have a question. Sure. So Christian, this is Ronald, in case you don't know where the voice is coming from. Um, regarding keyword discovery, uh, what tools do you suggest in addition to Google? Because I've seen a few uh, other sites that have really great data for like, I don't know, whatever keyword for a product, say the Nikon camera. Yeah. So you, you looked on Google, but then there's other sites that will do, you know, maybe how popular a, you know, a keyword is. Uh, do you use any other ones? And when selecting your keyword, um, are you using any Google tools for that as well? Yeah, so it depends, again, it depends on the business and the, what it, the company we're working with, but there's lots of really great tools out there, SEM Rush, uh, Agency Analytics, FRS, um, that will give you kind of more insights as you dive into the, the keywords there. Uh, there's some really good tools you can find online to look for like, like longer tail keywords that uh, work really well if somebody doesn't know specifically the product they're looking for, but they have a need. So they're asking Google a question rather than searching for a particular product. Um, but there's definitely, we can uh, send out a list with this presentation as well, the ones that we use. Great, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we'll be sure to add those. Um, Christian and I can, we can chat after and get some of those resources in the follow-up email as well. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Another question then. Um, is Google Shopping available for Canadians? Because I've, it seems like it's rolling out in the US uh, because now uh, Shopify can, can link with it, but not in Canada yet, or do you know? Yeah, it's, it's been, it's available in Canada for sure. Just to speak towards that, um, for my business, Google shopping ads are my bread and butter and I am only in Canada, so. Nice. I was going to say, I feel like Cray has some really good insight because he does a lot of this with his store. 
Okay, now I'm curious what you sell online, Kirk. Magic. Actual <laughs> magic tricks. So if you want to be a magician, trickyfingers.ca. But uh, after a bunch of testing and playing around, uh, the Google shopping ads perform way better for me than any other type of Google ad uh, outside of retargeting. But right now, I pretty much just run those because um, I played around with my bidding on it. Uh, started at like $1.50. I'm now down, my max bid is $0.65, cents, though I rarely ever pay that. And I usually get $80 to $100 orders. So the last time I got a conversion out of it, I paid um, $0.17 cents for the click for an $87 order. Awesome. That's amazing. That's super cool. It's so funny that you bring up the bike short um, example too. I was like, did he take a photo of what I was Googling earlier? Because that is exactly what was coming up earlier. <laughs> no, that would be odd. <laughs> It's really funny when we, when we assume our technology is listening to us because of how ads will just start showing up, yet it's just be, they know so much about us and our, and our behaviors that they just know when the right time to display something is, and it's super creepy, but super effective from a marketing standpoint. Yeah, that's one, one thing we found um, is people assuming that your devices are listening to you, but then you, then you realize that Google Maps is tracking what stores you're going to. Um, it knows what you're, you know, what you're ordering online, what you're researching, what you're watching on your TV via YouTube. But, but uh, we can't, we forget all that, and we just assume that our devices are listening to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah they Google, Google, Google referred to them as micro moments, and the yeah. fact that we uh, that we live online, we we no longer go online to use the internet, but we're just constantly online, uh, just without even knowing it. Yeah. Um, speaking of YouTube though, have you done much in the way of YouTube marketing and how do you find uh, that those, cause I know that if you pick a certain type of ad and somebody skips it, you don't end up paying. So I know a lot of people have used that just to try and get the, like a free five second ad out of it. Uh, what do you kind of think about that tactic and what do you think about Google marketing or sorry, YouTube marketing before yeah. videos? We, I mean, I can, I'm speaking from like what we like us specifically marketing ourselves. Um, cause our team will be delivering the, you know, the marketing of, for our clients. I find personally, I find that, um, anyone skipping the ad is probably disengaged anyway. Uh, so what I found is that the, the non-skippable ones are best, but re retargeted non-skippable ads. So, and I, like we've had that from, from the sales process where if somebody's visited our, the Marwick website, they're, they're interested to learn how we can grow their business. And then they book a, a discovery or a deep dive call two, two days later. During those two days, they're on YouTube and whatever, and they're, they're that these little 10 second like Marwick adverts really like resonate with them to the point where they mention it on the phone call. They're like, Hey, I, saw, I can't believe I saw you guys on YouTube. I want the same for my business. <laughs> so for us, like just specifically from us, that's one of the, one of the big ones for sure. That's really awesome. It's uh, I'm involved in another company and uh, I'm trying to, put together a plan for YouTube marketing. And that's kind of exactly what I wanted to do was some kind of re retargeting and try and get them to, to make a call to us. Yeah, it's been good. I've been involved with some uh, bigger campaigns with um, suspension seating for power boats across the US. And, and we, we took that like another layer, another level for where we split out all the demographics and we had very specific, um, really cool ads that not only retargeted people, but spoke to their specific demographic as well. And that was really cool to see how much better the demographic, the, the metrics got in terms of the engagement uh, and how they resonated with them. Yes. I'm actually gonna share in the chat here, um, Think with Google did a um, little story on IKEA Canada and how they used YouTube marketing um, to specifically target beds to people that were like watching YouTube videos late at night. <laughs> so they were actually hitting them with like sleepy time ads right when they were, you know, like having problems sleeping, like you need a better bed. like. Beautiful, like th this is perfect kind of targeting. If you, you know people aren't usually up that late and you want to sell them a bed, like yeah. perfect. Something's not right, you're not in bed. Yeah. That is such a good example. I love that. 
I do want to just call out again to our participants that if you do want to ask a question, you can pop that question in the chat, or you can also um, unmute yourself and join the conversation. Use this time. It's it's awesome. Um, I mean, Cray has some really good insight in terms of like the products that he's he's selling. But um, if you have a specific product that you're thinking about potentially using any of these marketing uh, tactics for, let's chat about it because this is a perfect time to to kind of brainstorm some ideas as well. I actually find brainstorming with other people, particularly people that aren't really necessarily in your industry, they will come at you with a perspective that you, you didn't even think of. So involving people that uh, are around you that aren't necessarily going to be interested in your product, just to get that whole other perspective can get you a whole, whole other way down a whole other marketing path. So I do have a product. If first of all, if anyone else wants to, to jump in and, and ask, Anyone else? No? Okay. So basically, I have a product. And uh, so I do a lot of work between here and China, photography and, and trade, actually. Uh, one of my marketing clients, for um, they're a natural health product producer here in Canada. So they make vitamins and stuff like that. So we've been exporting it. Well, because of what's happened in the world now, I'm making a line of immune system boosting vitamins and other products. We're starting with vitamins, and basically, uh, I predict that immune system boosting health products and functional foods will become very popular in the next couple of years. So this is, I'm making a brand now, um, going to be selling on Shopify, um, basically it will be ready this summer. So thinking of what audiences, what communities, and what other products around it um, would be good to add on. And I understand, you know, and Christian, I understand that uh, health products, supplements, they're quite competitive online on Google, mm -hmm. probably because everyone's paying up the AdWords because it's so competitive. But at any rate, um, do you guys have any feedback or thoughts about that? Yeah, I, the on competitiveness, it's, um, it pays a lot to be, uh, specific, like um, crazy kind of example of the beds at night, you know, like really spending the time to figure out strategy of like what point does somebody turn to Google on their cell phone and look for, uh, you know, vitamin or a health supplement and really like honing in on like very specific keywords and, and specific times of the day and specific demographics. You're, you're always find that there's always going to be the big players that spend tons of money. Uh, and think, I always think that's like foundation to foundation, but there's always cracks in the foundation. And when you find that crack, you don't need, you know, you, you, if you only need 1% or 2% of the market share, you just got to look for those little cracks and then it becomes like more cost effective to, to get that one or 2% of a bigger, huge market. That's yeah, my thought on that one for sure. I agree with that, but uh, for anything in the health-related industry, content marketing is going to be a, a huge thing. You'll notice that uh, a lot of the biggest players uh, in supplements and, and that type of stuff tend to have a really uh, in-depth blog and uh, quite engaged blog and social media. So really trying to, to find good content for that and similar, similar to the marketing uh, uh, ad side, look for those gaps because you'll always find, if you search anything doing research yourself on something you'll find you know the the same kind of content in 10 different articles but they're all talking about the same things just in slightly different ways find the gaps and answer answer the questions that they are not answering and not hitting you and then then you'll start to hit those other people that they're not hitting as well and that really helps long term because you're basically starting at the at the top of the chain and then people are going to start copying your articles <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. And then to further that point, it's all crazy. Like you can, um, by using that, going back to the display campaigns and targeting people, we talked about in market based on everyone's kind of like ping in interactions with Google, but you can actually target people based on the topic of a, an article as well. So if you have a particular health product that, um, you know, somebody's going to be researching and it mentions a particular health problem, and you're the solution, you can target, it's like having very specific ad placements based on 
the uh, the topic of the blog, not just uh, them being in market or the retargeting as well. And again, it's getting like like Craig said, it's getting them much higher up the funnel. They may they may not even be at the point that they're looking for a health product or a supplement. They just know they have a problem and they're trying to understand it and research it. So that they're they're, much, they're up here. And then you're beating your competition because they haven't got to the point now where they're on Google looking for supplements. And that's where it gets more competitive. I actually thought about uh, well, what I've been doing is, is making a brand and a community around, or the plan is to make a community around this. Um, and then starting off, actually, it started with PPE, but that was just a start. It's, it's not my main product, actually. It's going to be these health products and other protection products like uh, like hand sanitizer dispensers or disinfecting machines or whatever. So I figure, I mean, these, these products are different enough that they're not in the same category, but they fall under safety and protection. So I can build something around there um, to engage the community. And then I realized that I have to figure out where is the community. Is it older people or, you know, who's going to be wanting these vitamins? Like kids are probably going to, like parents will buy for the kids. The kids may not even know. Well, the, the biggest thing, whether you're doing paid marketing or any other type of marketing, is understanding your target audience before you do any of that. Because otherwise, it's really easy to spend a ton of money or a ton of time uh, putting together either the actual ads, uh, Google, Facebook, anywhere, or the actual content for it to not, not hit the mark. Right, yeah. I'm on my fifth version of my business plan because of, of all that. Like, I'm really exploring the target markets and then flipping it to the other target markets and um, I'm just in the middle of it. That's why I figure it out later. Thanks guys. There's a question in the chat here from Stacy. Any ideas for selling small business, social media workshops online example, new business starting on Facebook. I, I think it goes back to what Craig was just saying, like understand who it is that will be willing to sign up for the workshops and who you're targeting. And, and I would say if that still leaves you quite a broad group, focus in on a very specific group. So if you're thinking that it's going to attract um, young females, I would even go like much further than that and say, uh, young females in a certain area that have an interest in like something out, like just get really drilled down to a much smaller segment. Like if you if you can segment it and then segment your group five more times, then you're going to have a very specific persona or person that you want that you know that you know would be a great fit for your courses, and then it becomes easy that then to talk to them via like your ad copy and your messaging and the content in your ads is gonna resonate hard with those guys and strong, that they're more likely to convert. Whereas if you're trying to target every young female with the same kind of messaging and language, uh, it's gonna get lost on about 90% of them. So just really being having a very, very clear idea of who that person will be that you want to engage. And that, then, that, then that applies for everything, Facebook ads, YouTube, blogging, it's, uh, but being too broad usually ends up being uh, a waste of time. I picture that as basically throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. <laughs> if you know exactly where yes. to throw it and what you're throwing it to, it's more likely to stick than just, just throwing it everywhere. <laughs> yes. And another thing now, we can't really do much of this right now, but um, in your local area, um, go and attend some events that people are putting on when events are back on uh, uh, that help small businesses and see who is there, who is there trying to learn. Uh, you can kind of do that now by attending online events, but uh, because a lot of people have cameras off and stuff, you're not necessarily getting the same kind of thing. But if you jump into like Facebook groups or Reddit groups that are talking about small business marketing and stuff, you can kind of get a better idea of the types of people that are working on this and kind of figure out which part of that uh, market that you want to target. Cause that there's going to be people at all stages, you know, 18 to 25 year olds, 25 to 35 and, and all these different people. So finding out which, which one of those demographics you really want to talk to the most or that resonates most with you will really help you try and 
figure that out because by far the hardest thing that you can do is trying to figure out who you're selling to. Uh, I'm working on three different customer profiles for that other business that I mentioned right now. Uh, and even though it's been around for 17 years, they, they haven't had that up until now. Nobody's really done a customer avatar or multiple customer avatars. So I have a lot of data to go on, but still we're trying to really narrow it down and really figure out the, the, the targets and how we want to advertise to each one. So we're kind of getting to the end. So if you have any last minute questions, pop them in the chat or speak up. Um, but just to kind of finish it off, I have two questions for you, Christian. So one, if somebody had tried every, uh, tried and they decided this is not for me, I would like to just pay for somebody, how could somebody who's attending work with you? How do, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, and second, if somebody is just starting out, wants to give it a try, what is, if you could give them three tips, what would they be? Yes, uh, so the first one's really easy. Um, you just can Google us. <laughs> uh, that's the easiest way. Um, or LinkedIn or Facebook or TikTok or Pigeon Carrier or we're pretty accessible. Pigeon Carrier I think is like probably the best part and best one. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then the other way um, for sure I would like I mentioned earlier like I would invest time in just doing a couple of courses because more so that the, like the terminology is all really foreign when you first get started and that can be like what the hell, like it's, it's like a second language. The actual process of doing it all, it's actually pretty straightforward, but the terminology can put a lot of people off. So doing it like a couple of courses, uh, most of it, like there's a lot of them that are actually, you know, they're free to do. Google has some really great ones. Um, and then the second tip is to, uh, to not just set it and forget. Like that, you see that a lot and what just the nature of the platform, it, it's an auction, you know, you're bidding all the time as Craig mentioned, like you, you have to go in and adjust. If you just set it up and forget about it, it's, it's going to run at about 10% efficiency. So just being aware that there's something you're going to have to go in like on a really on a daily basis, at least in, at the very minimum once a week, just to tweak your bidding and make sure it's a working. And then the third one is to keep testing. Like there's a ton of data you get from this, um, you know, change your ad copy. It's very easy to, to, to change all the ads, ad side of things uh, once you're set up. So swapping out, running similar ads to see which ones work better than others, all that kind of stuff. But I think the biggest one is just to get a good understanding of, of the terminology and how it works. And then you always always have Google support there that you know you can do the live chat with them and they're usually pretty good at kind of walking you through that process. Just as a quick note, uh, I dropped in the chat there the uh, uh, Google Skill Shop where they have their online training for pretty much all their free tools. That's awesome. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Christian. This was awesome. I know I learned a lot, um, a lot of insight that I didn't know. So thank you. Um, Cray, Nikki, did you guys have any other questions or points or anything? Yeah. So we have a wonderful um, Slack instance, which um, is, if you don't know what Slack is, it is kind of like a communication tool, a messaging tool, like Amazon Messenger, but better. Um, and we have one for British Columbia. So if you are from British Columbia, I heard there was someone here from the UK. Um, you could sneak in, but it's British Columbia oriented. Um, there's a link in the chat. Feel free to join. We hang out in there. Other um, businesses hang out in there. We announce all of our events in there. Feel free to uh, join. Yeah, and last but not least, um, so we do, we've been busy getting some of our events set up for July, um, and we've got some pretty cool ones coming up. So we'll send out a follow-up email with some of the resources that we went over today, um, the recording and the presentation deck, and just some links to some of the upcoming um, workshops. Keep an eye on them. Um, I'm really excited for a few of them. I think uh, it's gonna be really insightful. Thank you so much, Christian. This is wonderful. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome.
Amazing. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I say we can get going, um, but feel free to reach out if you do have any questions later on. Um, we're always here to support you. Pop into the Slack and, and we're around. Thank you. Amazing. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, guys.